Hello and welcome to the Unmissable Movies podcast with me, Stephen Hayes, and my colleague, Sam Cox. Hey. <laughs> how are you, Sam? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm really good. I was thinking about how a, a couple of episodes ago we discussed what movies we were watching and I mentioned that I'd watch it. I'd watch it. I'd watch it. <laughs> I'd watch Ed. <laughs> Sam's been learning ye olde English. <laughs> What have you been? What have you watched, Ed, Sam? I was thinking about how a couple of episodes ago we discussed what movies we were watching, and um, yeah. I said to you that I'd watch Jojo Rabbit, and so here we are, a couple of weeks later, and uh, episode for today is indeed Jojo Rabbit. I never thought we'd end up doing a movie that's so recent, because the whole thing is unmissable movies that you might have missed. So we've been delving back into some. You know, so far, some films from the 90s and noughties. So Jojo Rabbit kind of just came out before Christmas, didn't it? So how, what's our angle here, Sam? How is it unmissable? How, why well, might people have missed I, it? Well, what, I think it's nice to talk about movies that are like bang up to date if we can. And I mm. think, um, you know, whether or not this this ultimately gets missed in the, the history books. Um, it's still an unmissable film, in my opinion. And Good point. I think you could argue, especially looking at the, the the awards ceremony for this year that's just gone, man, this was this was the little guy on campus, this movie. This was it, there were some heavy heavyweight films in the in the mix. You know, we had nineteen seventeen, um, we had big offerings from Scorsese and mm. Tarantino. So just it just had a little it had a fight on its hands to get noticed and um so i th- and but also you know it's a kind of a sat- satirical slightly contentious although i think we'll get into how non-contentious yeah. and controversial it really is yeah, yeah but i think it being a pretty niche um subject matter might have pushed it into a a slightly darker corner anyway and so i yeah i don't know how many people saw it but yeah, i don't of course. care it's our podcast <laughs> exactly we can decide what we want to do Good point. And uh, it's worth noting that certainly in the UK, it, it came into the cinemas in January. And this little known global health crisis known as COVID-19 kind of hit, or the rumblings of that kind of came in. So probably by mid-February, people were being pretty cautious about public gatherings. So that's why that's why I hadn't seen it. So I saw the trailers and thought, this. I think this looks good. Seemed seemed quite zany. This little kid's got Hitler as an imaginary friend. Not not sure, but I'll probably see it. And then I just forgot about it entire, entirely until that moment in that episode. So, so I think even in that episode, you say you saw Jojo Rabbit, and I'm like, great, because <laughs> I just I knew nothing about it, um, and I tried yeah. to hide that somewhat because I was a little bit ashamed. Uh, but yeah, after you mentioned it. Uh, my wife and I, we were we were looking at films to watch, and I thought, let's give it a go. And boy, was I glad I watched it. So, for anybody who hasn't seen it, just a little bit of context: this is a, a 2019 movie, I guess, yeah. uh, directed by Taika Waititi. It's based on a book, um, and it's a satirical comedy, really about, um, yeah, as you mentioned, a little boy who is kind of a Nazi Hitler fanatic. He's a Hitler um, youth. Uh, he's a Hitler youth, yeah. yeah. And um, it's essentially this... Uh, it's a, the, the story deals with this gradual dismantling of his sort of fanaticism um, through really what you, what you find out through his mother's resistance work. Um, her, his mother's played by Scarlett Johansson and she... Uh, it, we find out that she's been hiding a little Jewish girl upstairs in the cavity in the wall. And so, of course, there's lots of comedy, lots of heart, lots of humor, uh, lots of drama. And the journey of the movie is this boy kind of gradually dismantling his fanaticism and realizing that, you know, through a lot of poignancy, that he's uh, able to essentially fall in love with this little Jewish girl upstairs. Yeah. As And so that's that's ultimately the the... the the back to front of this uh, plot. Yeah. And straight away in this movie, I've never had such a kind of like, it's so immediate. It lets you know what the movie's about so quickly. So the very first scene is Jojo uh, preparing to go to this Hitler youth camp. And 
his imaginary friend, which is Hitler, which obviously he knows nothing of Hitler, but this is his imagination projection, projection yeah. of Hitler. And Hitler basically gives him this massive pep talk, like, come on, you can do it. Hi, on me. <laughs> He's like, come on, you can do better than that. And it's just critiquing his his Heil Hitlering, and you kind of, and then he works him into a frenzy, so that this little boy's just shouting Heil Hitler over and over and over. Yeah, and the then, first and scene then... is him running through the streets shouting Heil Hitler with glee. <laughs> to, I mean, it's like this sort of Billy Elliot quasi. Yeah. It's like extremely contemporary and just so funny. Yeah, um, and it's got. And the Beatles, obviously, in their early days, did a lot of stuff in in Germany, uh, I think in Hamburg. So they recorded a number of their tracks in German. So before the song even kicked in, I kind of felt like it almost had elements of A Hard Day's Night about it. Almost when you ran out of the house, you expected there to be like a sea of other people running in the same direction. And then I Want to Hold Your Hand in German comes in. And it's ridicu- it. ridiculously playful. <laughs> Considering the premise is a World War Two film based in Germany, mm-hmm. you're like, what oh, am I that watching? Song, that song sets the tone. Totally. It's brilliant. It's so good. And then there's this, um, the opening sort of credits, kind of equating the Beatlemania thing with the rise of Nazism. Yeah. It's not a comparison I would have, would have, would have ever made, but it's so, <laughs> it's just funny. It's just clever and funny. And I think um, one of the things that I think this film get, got a bit of a bad rap or is was and possibly still is misunderstood, you know, anytime you try and deal with, obviously, the, the horror of what happened during World War II, it's going to it's gonna feel controversial. It's going to just feel like a no-go area. And I think one of the things worth saying right up front, and, and I felt again watching it last night, is that it's not particularly controversial. You know, it's a contentious subject. Mm. But, um, you know, because obviously how many times have the Nazis been the source of satire? But it, but I think that's one of the things that's so brilliant about this film. You have to have a deft touch to do something well with this subject. Um, and I think the reason it works, and as we'll get into, is because this film on balance is more, probably more poignancy and heart than satire and, and comedy. Oh, yeah, And the blend sure. that they managed, the blend they managed to pull off... Um, you know, all credit to the writer of the original story. Mm. Um, it was a 2008 book called Caging Skies by Christine uh, Leunens. And I don't know, haven't read the book. I don't know how much of it made its way through to the movie. Uh, but, yeah. you know, and Taika, Taika uh, Waititi, who I think you might know his work better than I do. I've seen his film Hunt for the Wilder People, which I loved. It felt I haven't seen a it, lot no. More, it felt a lot more indie than this one. But I think... You know, even that speaks of um, just his sort of rise through the ranks of of, uh, of Hollywood. Yeah. That well, he's, yeah, he's I've really... seen I've seen uh, Thor Ragnarok because I have a you know the Marvel films are a guilty pleasure in terms of just something that you can mindlessly have on in the background. Uh, so his his Thor film is hilarious and takes and takes those movies in a completely different direction. Yeah, see, I didn't even know he'd he directed anything on that sort of scale like because i assumed he was this sort of small indie director well he he Um, was he was i think that was his probably his first step into something kind of big prominent hollywood uh film uh and he also directed one of the episodes of the mandalorian but yeah so in the initial kind of sense is that this is a seemingly controversial film that isn't now it's worth saying here is a little bit of a disclaimer we're both white and british well i'm actually irish but we most mo- both of us have spent most of our lives in the uk no you have to know what you're going into for this film because it's it's like you say it's satire you know it's the kind of humor where it exposed like it really exposes the true stupidity really of the person that it's satiring yeah um, but the only way you can do that is by really going there you have to go there to go there you know and so but they've um, taken it to yeah, the extreme, there's... haven't they? The device of Hitler being the imaginary friend took satiring Adolf Hitler into the mega extreme. But it's it's brilliant, and it's uh, you know Taika Waititi is Jewish himself, so it's you know he, you could you could argue yeah. he, he's uh, in a good position to do it. So 
where do we begin? We talked about that opening scene, and I think the fact that you know we're introduced early on to this imaginary uh, projection of of Hitler being his kind of kind of constant companion uh, is something that keeps coming back all the way through the movie. And um, then quite quickly we move on to the introduction of the rest of the sort of comedy cast of uh, hapless Nazis <laughs> um, trying to conduct this. Uh, Hitler Youth Camp, and so we've got Sam Rockwell, um, Rebel Wilson. I mean, who who knew that those two would be a comedy duo? I know. <laughs> it's it's so um, left field. It really is. You've got um, Alfie <laughs> Allen as well from Game of Thrones fame in that mix as well. Yeah, and I love it that the, the movie it just gets on, it just gets right up, right into it. It just dives in, um, and the whole thing is paced so well. It barrels through really all the way through to oh, the yeah. end um but let's talk about uh the one of the things i noticed um re- I, th- I think on the rewatch some somewhat more was um the how bright this film is just in terms of cinematography like it pops it's so full of color it's a very sunny film mm. um the just noticing how vivid some of the the kind of the grading is in you know the costume design in yeah. the um the interior of the house you know that yeah. jojo lives in well taika um, waititi and... actually actually said um in one one of his interviews that he, it, during his research he realized that actually parts of germany during the second world war were very uh, bright and vibrant and they were very fashion conscious and any war film you see is pretty is pretty bleak and 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 certainly you're mm-hmm. not seeing it from the side of of everyday Germans who weren't necessarily for the war. So it's it's quite it's, yeah it's very stark, isn't it? That and and obviously Scarlett Johansson's character Rosie is so fashionable and yeah, so it's really colourful and and um, it kind of oddly juxtaposes the the backdrop of the Second World War in in a really peculiar way. Yeah, and I think it's one of the reasons that it it makes it really watchable. Like it's it's just a pleasure to watch. It's enjoyable yeah. um, for so many reasons. I think this is one of them. I think the whole the whole tone of it, you know, and I, you know, you 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 press play on a movie like this with some degree of trepidation. But I feel like so quickly you, when you watch this, you realize this isn't this kind of really zany art house lewd gratuitous film. Like it's just it's not I think it's a twelve rating. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned that, you know, what Taika Waikiti did was, you know, the film's colourful and it pops and the kind of the narrative the silliness kind of dials down as, as the seriousness of the narrative dials mm-hmm. up. But then there's also brilliant uh moments of payoff all throughout the film and there's subtle things uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did Shutter Island, and we said the second watch was a totally different film. Now, it's not the case with this, but there's there are a lot of things that stand out to you way more in the second watch. And he's so intentional about why you see what you're seeing and how mm-hmm. how that plays out. You know, you've got the um, the the old Chekhov's gun thing, where they where the theory is if you have a gun on the stage during the first act you better have someone fire it in the second act you have to have that payoff yeah and Mm -hmm. there's two really major mega themes in this film based around one shoes and two dancing so i loved actually the second time watching it through how many Mm -hmm. times it showed the 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 character's feet you know you see rosie scarlett johansson's character uh, tying and teaching the teaching his son to tie laces and showing his shoes. You see his mother's shoes on the table as she's dancing and as they go for a walk. Uh, when Elsa, the Jewish girl, is is looking around the sister's bedroom, it shows her shoes hanging up on the mm-hmm. wall. So there's this kind of consistent thing that you don't really notice the first time, but then obviously on the shoe front. Um, there's a pretty big reason why that's so significant and it's probably worthwhile having a little spoiler alert on that isn't there yeah let's come back to that later on when we're talking about some of the best scenes okay but i i agree i thought there were so many so 
and again, watching it the second time, you realize how many little delicate threads. You know, there's nothing throwaway in the first half. Like, even little things that you think, oh, it's just a funny gag. It's just a funny throwaway thing. Like when um, when his imaginary Hitler says something like, you know, oh, I'm going now to, to have unicorn for dinner. You know, and then later on, there's this very fleeting shot of him actually tucking into a unicorn. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> it comes back. Yeah, there's also the bit where he's in the room with Jojo and he he says, like, bye for now and just jumps out the window. And then later in the film, Jojo, I think, kicks him through what I think is the same window mm-hmm. when he says yeah. the brilliant line. Every little joke, F- every F- little F- moment F- comes back. Yeah, that's the one of the best lines of any movie of all time, surely. <laughs> um, uh, but, yeah, the, even, like, uh, the Sam Rockwell, his character... Um, you know, earlier on in the movie, he draws this sort of stupid, facile dream uniform, like a child. You know, draws his his like a, his dream, his dream battle uniform, and it just seems like this dumb gag. And then an hour later, when they yeah, have this the huge height battle, battle scene, in the height of battle, he emerges into the scene wearing this ridiculous outfit, and it's brilliant. It's, it, so it's, good. it's like, it's like, it's just hilarious and sort of touching in a weird way. Um, but there's nothing throwaway. So let's talk a little bit about the cast. Um, this mm. is uh, the introductory role for Roman Griffin Davis, who's a young uh, British actor who plays Jojo. Um, there's also a girl from um, New Zealand called Thomasine McKenzie, who plays um, Elsa. How are you pronouncing her first girl. name? I couldn't get it. Thomasine? Thomasine, I think, yeah. Or Thomasine. Um, and she is just fantastic as well. There's also uh, that, actually, I don't have his name in front of me, but he was like, to me, the little tiny golden heart in the middle of this film. Um, oh, his friend yeah. Yorkie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's so good. He's um, brilliant. And yeah. just sort of honest. It's the most honest performance I think I've ever seen in a film. Um, it's like, let's let's just pick a, let's pick a primary school kid out of school, out of year five, yeah. and just put him in costume and throw him on set. That's just what it feels like, and it's so good. That not not to, that's not me, un, you know, undermining his performance. No, no. He's... Um, but there's so much honesty there. And when then, he says um... at the end, uh, it's a really bad time to be a Nazi. Oh my goodness! <laughs> his delivery of that line had me it's rolling hilarious. in the aisles. It's so good. Hilarious. Yeah. So the young cast really holds so much of this film together, and 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 actually a lot of the poignancy in the back half of the film that we were talking about comes from um, Roman Griffin Davis. Because I, in the first half, it felt like when um, when Elsa, when Thomasine McKenzie is introduced, it was like, oh, suddenly here's a character with some real layers and some mm. depth. And for that to be, you know, said of such a young actress is, is pretty awesome. But later on in the film, man, Roman Griffin Davis pulls out the stops. Like he's he really does a good job yeah, he's, of just he's brilliant. portraying some of the, the pain and... Um, you know the just the complexity of what he's processing well they then, they they chose him off the back of um they had a thousand audition tapes sent into them and yeesh. so that's a lot of that's a lot of kids to rifle through so you have to be good to to rise to the top of that many audition tapes now i did see um just prepping for this that his dad uh ben davis is actually a pretty famous photo uh, cinema cinematographer rather and he's done quite a number of kind of big disney marvel films quite okay. noteworthy so whether and whether or not you know <laughs> actually do you know what his dad was actually a cinematographer on three billboards which sam rockwell was in so you kind of wonder you know was there some yeah there's some threads coming a, together a few there. E- a few emails might have been sent let's say that much who but knows but all it the doesn't, same doesn't matter he's incredible he is incredible yeah so you mentioned um sam rockwell and this is the third he it, Three years back to back, he has appeared in what ended up being the best picture, uh, a, a best picture nominee. Yeah, um, which is pretty amazing. So he is in this film, and um, he's a, he's an incredible. I put him in the same category as uh, Paul Giamatti, like just a brilliant character actor. Seldom stars in anything, but he, I've never seen him in anything where he hasn't done an incredible job. And he's of course he's Wild Bill, isn't he, in The Green Mile? Yeah, that's my first sort of. Introduction, introduction to him and yeah. that's like the 
definitive role of his for me, but obviously he's been so many great things since. Yeah, yeah. And he plays Captain Klensendorf in this movie, um, who is a character who we should come back to uh, a little bit later. But for now, um, we've also got Stephen Merchant, who I think steals the show he's in so his good. little in his little Dirt. scene that he's in. Yeah. Oh, so funny. Um, and just the little moments where he like scene. he he throws his German accent to the wind on just a few moments. Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, come, come look at this, fellas. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You think yeah. they say cut? You did a Brist Bristonian accent, but it doesn't matter. And he and he actually yeah. carries he carries just enough threat actually in the moments where he needs to, where you think, ah, yeah, good casting. Yeah. It evokes slightly the dude from um, Indiana Jones, you know, the in, what, Raiders. creepy Nazi with the hat. Uh, yeah, in Raiders. The yeah. coat hanger guy. Exactly him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he's in it. And then Rebel Wilson's probably the last person to mention. And, I, and she, you know, she's been in so many. Um, uh, she's appeared like this in quite a lot of films. Um, but I actually really, I actually really enjoyed her sort of addition yeah, in this. Likewise. I think she's some of the proper light relief. Oh yeah, um, for and sure. then we obviously can't miss out um, Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson, Hansen. man alive. So she came obviously into prominence, I think, with um, Bill Murray translation. What's the Lost in Translation? And and mm-hmm. I remember seeing that, and I think she might have been in a couple of like family films growing up as well. But down the years, she she has shown she is an incredible actress. And in this yeah. film, she never overdoes it, but she. She's so warm, and you and they do a great job, both her performance and the the direction, of making you warm to her very quickly. Even the little like the little the little like mouth click she does, and the pen- yeah, she walks into the house and does that sort of robot Egyptian dance da- yeah. robot thing. It's just little little details like that. I think if you took her out of this movie, it might not have been nominated for best picture. Yeah, I agree. I think she's that. I think she's that good in it. Yeah, I think it's her best role. And her, like her, her scenes, particularly with Elsa behind the wall, you know, where the two of them are having, you know, she, um, spoiler alert, she, she's lost her actual daughter. You know, Jojo is her only surviving child, mm. and so she kind of, um, she's kind of adopted this this Jewish girl, and those those scenes are so special. Yeah, because of Scarlett Johansson and her depth, and then there's another scene where. Um, we assume the father in the picture, you know, Jojo's dad is, is, is another resistance guy or he's off somewhere fighting. Fighting. Yeah. Um, and she kind of spontaneously acts out, uh, by throwing some soot on her face. She kind of paints a beard on and acts out Yeah. her, her father. And, and it's like, it's so, um, moving, you know, and touching and, um, that's all her. So should we move on then to talk about, um, favorite scenes, some of the scenes that uh, stand out in this film. Yeah, um, I, I mean the one, like, the one, the one you just mentioned, I suppose. The you know when she suddenly says, "You want your dad, eh?" and and just walks away slowly, smears the soot on her face, and then yells at, yells at Jojo as the dad. And then has a little walks away, has a little conversation between the two parents, you know, by herself, and that that leads to them doing this really dorky dancing and it's that's the scene that really like because uh, obviously every week you've actually brought in a, a scene that you think is the real heartbeat of the movie mm-hmm. and i'm mm-hmm. i'm not sure it is that but it's pretty close because i think yeah it speaks to um jojo's lack of a father which is probably why he's you know invented this fake father figure in this um idiotic you know fanciful version of hitler mm. um uh, but it just it peels back the layers on their whole family scenario and why they're in the place they are in yeah. such a moving and and sort of eloquent way like it's a very simple eloquent thing that speaks of so much yeah and i think then there's an obvious scene which you might have so i'll, I'll put a pin in that for now but i think the scene with uh dirts so stephen merchant's character as when he comes in i love that whole scene from start to finish it's brilliant so the kind of like systematic way they all have to say Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler, Heil Hitler. It's, it's so like, it's, it's it's so throwaway. It's like, all right, all right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Heil Hitler, uh, my Heil favorite Hitler, are Hitler. Sam Rockwell's 
Just go back and watch Sam Rockwell's Heil Hitlers. They are hysterical. Well, he's obviously just so disenfranchised. So throughout the film, you know, he's just swigging back whiskey. He's just lost it. And yeah, yeah, you you've obviously got the, the his character his relationship with Finkel, Alfie Allen's character, who by and large it would seem that they they're homosexual, and that they are a gay couple. And there's enough to allude to that. And even the moment where the two of them are kind of like stare at each other, and then Jojo walks in, they're like, <clears throat> <laughs> um, but in that scene, there's a few... it's so subtle because again, the first time, uh. Stephen Merchant Dirtz says, what brings you here, Captain? And he's obviously like, the first time you think, oh, he's just late, or but you don't really think of it. But then the second time around, you realize he's found out that they're doing a search of the house and he rushes there to basically yeah. try and get in the way of, of them finding anything out. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. that, whole, that whole scene is brilliant. Loads of funny moments and obviously Stephen Merchant. But then you've also got the the suggestion that uh, Sam Rockwell's character is actually sympathetic. Is, is sympathetic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it manages to save uh, first Elsa um, in that scene, and then towards the end of the movie, he saves Jojo. So he's kind yeah, of the, it... the unspoken hero of the film in a way. But that um, that scene, I, I can't think of another scene in any movie that manages to put tension, genuine tension and humor smack next to each other like that um because it's like it's one of the scariest scenes in the movie but also one of the funniest yeah um i suppose i love that scene merchant casting merchant is always going to do that though because he is he's a comedy actor isn't he? he's a comedy writer and actor so him being there his face his smile and his eyes just make make me want to laugh yeah and there's a there's a (laughs) moment where he's talking to sam rockwell and he's already i think six seven and they put Stephen Merchant on a box to make him look even taller than Sam Rockwell, just for comedic effect. <laughs> and to, I suppose... But Sam, make... Rockwell's, Sam Rockwell's used to that, having worked with uh, the guy that played... John Coffey. John Coffey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who I think stood on a box for most of the film. <laughs> yeah, so that that's a fantastic um, scene. And then uh, you might want to talk about the, the butterfly reveal scene, Sam. Have you got that on your list? Yeah. Now, of course, in the yeah. scene earlier on, you said, uh, spoiler alert, the uh, sisters died. You might want to give a slightly longer pause for the for this spoiler alert. So, spoiler alert on this one. Is that a long enough pause? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Scarlett Johansson, Jojo's mother who we've already established is kind of resistance. She's sneaking around, trying to do what she can to uh, sort of bring down the Nazi regime from the inside. She is, she's found out and um, she's captured presumably, and she is hung on the gallows in the middle of the town. We don't see any of that happen, um, but we do see uh, basically some allusions to it. So towards the beginning of the film, uh, Jojo and his mother are actually walking in the town square and they they come upon the the gallows and um and actually it's the first time that we realize that she's resistance because Jojo asks her you know what did they do why are they in the gallows what did they do and she replies what they could mm. and so it's a little a little um early sign that maybe she's um not what we would assume yeah and then you've mentioned it already, but we see the shoes. You know, we have a, a kind of a disproportionate amount of shots of her shoes throughout as she's walking along this pathway, walking along um, or dancing on the table. Like we, they, they go to great lengths to make sure we've we've seen her shoes and and got to really take in what they look like because this the scene that we're talking about, the reveal is, as you said to me, one of the biggest sucker punch moments in in all of cinema where the biggest um, jojo could be could be the biggest i've never had a moment in a film where i've been like (gasps) oh man so what happens is jojo is uh just out walking around and um he this little butterfly flies into his peripheral vision and he starts following it and sort of 
it kind of keeps his eyes down on the ground and he moves closer and closer towards the gallows in the center of the town square without realizing. And then as he stands up and the camera oh. pans up with him, you see that it's his mother's shoes dangling uh, in the gallows. And it's, yeah, it's a heartbreaking moment. And um, yeah, it's obviously a difficult crushing scene, but it's so memorable and so strong. And yeah, I think you know you, the the scene where he you know he attempts to tie her shoes, yeah. Um, earlier on, and she and she yeah she teaches she tries to teach him, and then there's the scene at the end of the movie where he successfully ties Elsa, who is now wearing his mother's shoes. Yeah. But I think the thing that's almost most crushing about it is that um she's she's dead obviously, but Jojo, the sweet in the sweetest way, just tries to tie her shoes oh, up no. while she's hanging there. And then the way he hugs her leg fails, it's, you know. It's absolutely crushing. Like I, I was like yeah, Beck Beck was like in tears and I was like, Oh he, man, that's such a sucker punch. Because you don't yeah. expect you don't expect them to lay anything on that heavy. And I was almost I was I was watching it like please zoom up and it's someone else who happens to have the same shoes. Like please. Oh yeah. it's, it's it's um yeah, it's just a very sobering moment that okay, this is a comedy, but the backdrop is it's still brutal and um you don't get the impression they know she's harboring elsa but she, they obviously know she's doing uh, enough pamphleting and yeah. yeah yeah um yeah so and there's almost a i i discovered this online just randomly but there's someone's put together the shot of i think they're walking by a canal and there's a shot of jojo and and just rosie and her shoes and then the shot where it reveals her hanging is almost like for like and it's yeah it's incredible and it's only in that moment that you think even in the few scenes leading up to that moment you don't you you think oh yeah she has been absent for a little while like you you realize you haven't seen her on screen for for quite a few scenes and then it even makes darker and changes the complete reading of the Stephen merchant scene because first watching that's like completely jovial and he seems a bit bumbling but then you the second time you watch it he does pay particular attention to the mum being quite busy almost like he's suspicious already and you think well mm-hmm. obviously those suspicions led to her yeah, death there's so. real sinister there's some real sinister stuff going on of course yeah which leads us on to um some some quotes some dialogue some of our favorite lines yeah uh so I'll, I'll give you one and then you go ahead and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a few more. Uh, so it was in that first, in that first scene where Jojo grabs the grenade and runs off with it and Hitler prancing at the side of him, like an absolute <laughs> Egypt, <laughs> just making the stupidest faces like, yeah. um, and then he runs off and obviously gets half his face, you know, scarred and his leg injured and the and the way um captain um Klensendorf just turns to the rest of the boys and just says don't do that <laughs> it's just yeah. it's like again it's you know he doesn't rush over to check on him it's just he's so meh i'm done um yeah yeah how about you love it um oh there's just so many great comedy lines in this film um you know uh like you said earlier, it's a really bad time to be a Nazi, Jojo. <laughs> I love that line. Um, just funny little quirky things like, um, you know, when he walks up to Jojo crying, and he's like, what, what are you, a teardrop specialist? <laughs> the, this is like, this is like Taika Waititi, like summed up. Mm. Um, you know, unless you're hit the trapped in a fat kid's body, you'll have to deal with second place. Um, <laughs> Doesn't he then, then say, the- I'm a fat boy stuck in a fat boy's body or something? <laughs> something like that oh he's so funny um there's another line when hitler's yelling at jojo and he's like you know he's gotten himself into that classic hitler frenzy um you know spitting and throwing his arms around and he says do not let your german brain be bossed around that line is the definition of satire right there oh yeah you you just can't do you can't do it better there's a great line towards the end of the movie where Jojo and Elsa have realized they're, you know, really good friends. They love each other. And um, Jojo kind of confesses and says, you know, I'm not actually a Nazi. You know, I'm not a Nazi. He kind of concedes. Mm. 
and then she and then Elsa says, "I'm not a dirty Jew," and they kind of they've realized like, okay, like these were projections, mm. um, and that's not who we really are. Yeah, I love love that line. Yeah, for me, I mentioned earlier on that there were kind of two major threads or mega themes within the movie, and we we've said about the shoes and how the shots of shoes and tying of shoes kind of is a consistent thread but another one that isn't that consistent but it's still very much there is is about the dancing and you know there's quite a few really nice lines and and a few nice moments of payoff as well with that theme so obviously rosie the mother says dancing is for people who are free and 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 then she not just says that but she you know dances with jojo um then Jojo asks Elsa later on in the movie, what's the first thing you'll do when you're free? And she says, dance. And then right at the end, before they play he- uh, German heroes. Uh, which is David so Bowie, brilliant. Which is amazing. So brilliant. They don't say anything, but they look at each He says, what are you going to do now? Now, I think he says. And then she just starts moving. And they bo- mm-hmm. it goes back and forth. And they're both just you know just doing some hilarious dancing but it's not just like them bobbing they're doing little like hand movements and they're really animated and i, th- I for me like when they started dancing i thought ah oh, that's such a good moment after those those few lines about dancing that you get you know just speckled throughout the film um, yeah yeah it just it just made the whole thing feel quite a, quite a satisfying tie up and a quite a joyous ending well even having another well known song you know in english by a, a contemporary you know obviously heroes isn't uh, particularly contemporary but it is by you know 1945 standards but to have another song come back in where it's a very familiar song but with a german mm. it just felt like a great way to bookend the film you know with the beatles at the beginning and bowie at the end i know yeah good choice so uh, do you think there's any major issues with the film, Sam? I think you could you could argue, and I wondered this a little bit that it's, you know, for we've talked about this being one of its strengths, but because it's, you know, it's not crazy hilarious funny. It's not like a total drama. It's not. It never goes all the way in any one of those directions, and so mm-hmm. it's it's this balance of constituent parts, and I think you could argue that it creates a slightly watery nothing in the middle. But I, but I think that's harsh. You know, it's not South Park humor. Yeah. It's not high drama. It needs to straddle that fine line between those things. Yeah. You know, we, we mentioned earlier the, some of the things that were contentious. And I think one issue that I've, I've seen cropping up amongst uh, sort of the, the critics of this film mm. um, is that, you know, to actually have an, a sympathetic nazi character um is a pretty you know ill-timed thing to do what did you what do you think about that critique of the film yeah i i I found similar this and it it wasn't per none of these personal criticisms because i don't really have any but you know there were a number of of reviews that said and i think there's one in the independent here in the uk that said uh, you know it, it almost the portrayal of all the Nazis in the film are kind of like slapstick, befuddled, you know, just doing their day job. Like, you know, Rebel Wilson, she could just be that character in an office. You know, it's it undermines the seriousness of just how bad, you know, the wide majority of the Nazi party was, if not all. You, you have to believe there were reluctant people involved but by and large you know the atrocities they uh enacted on behalf of hitler <clears throat> are horrendous and history knows that so to have all have every single nazi character in the film seeming all right but just doing their doing their job you can see why that might jar for some yeah and i think that's that that's the um that's the tightrope that satire walks exactly. you know like i mentioned earlier you have to I mean, ultimately, what they're doing is making is totally making fun of um, the the stupid worldview, the stupid Nazi worldview um, that was, you know, completely nonsensical. Like, there's that great line that Yorkie again says at the end when they've 
we really realize they're losing the war. And he says, you know, our only friends now are Japanese. And between you and me, they don't look very Aryan. You know, there's all these great lines that that's the point of satire. It's to really, um, really go over the top in yeah. showing, showing the, the idiocy of something like racism or, yeah, or, or all kinds of things. So there we have it. It's been good to chat for a little while about this great recent film, Jojo Rabbit. If you didn't get a chance to see it yet, um, you definitely, definitely should. And um, hope you've enjoyed being with us. We'll see you next time for another episode of Unmissable Movies with me, Sam Cox, and my colleague, Steve Hayes. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed that, don't forget to click the like button. You can share this with your friends on Twitter and Facebook, TikTok probably. If you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about all our latest videos. And finally, if you're able to support the channel, please do follow the Patreon link in the video description. You'll get a load of bonus content from outtakes to shout outs and a bunch of other stuff. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.